Hello and welcome. I'm Arnand Naidu filling in for Riz Khan. The killing of any child is tragic, but when it's sanctioned by the state, it poses a serious moral and legal dilemma. International law forbids the execution of a child offender, yet this happens across the world in countries including the United States, China and Nigeria. The country with the greatest number of these executions is Iran. And for one former beauty queen and singer, campaigning against this practice has become her life's mission. Nazanin Afshin Jam has already saved one young girl in Iran, but her efforts are not without controversy. She joins us now from Vancouver in Canada. Don't forget we take your questions on the show. The numbers are there at the bottom of your screen. Nazanin, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. You have launched this campaign against uh, the death penalty, against executions in Iran, particularly children. Could you give us some idea of how widespread this uh, practice is in Iran? Yes, it's, um, the rates are quite high right now. There's about 81 minors on death row currently. And since 1990, they've, there's been over 20 executions of minors. So it's, it's a real grave problem right now. Now, are children, uh, are th those who have been sentenced to death, are they executed as children, or do the authorities and officials wait for them to become, uh, to g uh, you know, get past the age of 18 before they're executed? Well, the international law, um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Charter of the Rights of the Child state that you're not allowed to execute anyone who's committed an offense before the age of 18. Now, what the Islamic Republic of Iran does, they, they sort of bastardize the law, the international law, and they try to make it work with their own law. The Iranian penal code is based on an extreme form of Sharia law, which says that a girl is an adult at age 9 and a boy is an adult at age 15. So basically, they're criminally responsible for their actions at those ages. So what they do is they don't execute a nine-year-old girl now, working with international law. They wait till this nine-year-old girl turns 18, and then they carry out the execution. So they basically keep these minors in prison um, up until that age, and then they carry out the execution. So it's not really complying to the international code. But is it a, still a violation of uh, Iran's compliance with international treaties and international law? It definitely is, because Iran is state party to these international treaties, which blatantly forbid the execution of minors or those who have committed an offense before the age of 18. So um, they are going against their own treaties. These uh, death sentences that are passed on minors, is there any way of knowing for what particular, is there a group of crimes that they're accused of? Uh, they vary. They could be for drug trafficking. Um, a couple boys were executed a couple years ago for homosexuality. Um, some are charged with alleged murder. Um, most of them are, are accidental, mind you. And um, a girl was executed years ago as well for teaching Baha'i classes. So I wouldn't call them quite um, crimes, but um, this is, these are the things they're being executed for. And how are people executed in Iran? Uh, it's quite gruesome. Often, uh, or actually I should say, sometimes they're made public. Uh, what they do is they put a noose around the neck of these um, prison prisoners, and um, they they do a s slow method of execution. Basically, hung from a crane, they lift up the body. So it's not like a drop method where your neck is snapped right away and you you die right away. It's a slow, painful death where the person is basically a asphyxiated and 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 they die. And what about stonings? We've been hearing about people being executed by stonings. Yes, again, another um, thing that the Islamic Republic of Iran denies doing, but just a couple months ago, a man was buried and, and stoned to death for committing adultery. Now, um, people, if they're charged with adultery, that's the sentence. It's death by stoning. And um, there have been reports of cases of executions by stoning. Um, acts incompatible with chastity um, is faced with lashes. So there's different crimes for different crimes. Okay, let's get a call in from one of our viewers. Javed from Paris is calling in. Javed, go ahead with your question. Uh, good evening. Uh, yes, uh, indeed, I'm an Afghan, French, a French Afghan uh, living in Paris, so I saw the information on your TV, and uh, I'm, just, I'm just hungry about that. And 
I wanted to say that uh, I was uh, I wanted to condemn this act of barbary uh, in Iran, uh, the Afghan children who have been executed by Pandesan uh, in the uh, in the public place. So this is uh, uh, not human uh, treatment for the for the prisoners and especially for the children and Afghan children especially who have been suffering from war and terrorism and barbary and extremism. So I just wanted to tell to the Iranian uh, politicians and government people that uh, they are not human beings, just the animals. That was my my point of view. I'm I'm so sorry to to say this, but I'm so angry. I well, think we're all angry. <laughs> I think um, this is an act of barbary, and that's why it must be stopped. I mean, um, Iran is one of the only countries in the world that executes minors. There are other countries. We've reported cases on our StopChildExecutions.com site of people being executed um, or being condemned for execution minors in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Sudan. So it's not just um, a problem in Iran, but Iran is definitely the worst um, case, and um, it must be stopped immediately. Well, Nazanin, as you were pointing out then, as our caller pointed out, of course, that these executions are carried out in other countries as well. Now, you're a pretty high-profile figure. You're well-known. You're a former beauty queen. You're active in this campaign. Have you ever tried to influence the Iranian officials, uh, Iranian authorities, the government to change their policies? Uh, definitely. That's what our main goal is with StopChildExecutions.com. We're trying to put a permanent end to the situation because there are reports of minors who are being... Um, convicted and put on death row and while um, we must also uh, um, try to fight for each life um, the main problem has to be um, fixed and we're trying to put pressure to try to change the laws so we have a petition on our website which we encourage all of you to go on and sign the petition we have over 11,000 signatures um, including signatures from different government officials from around the world uh, Norway, Sweden, Canadian Parliament, um, Australia and um, many well-known human rights activists are getting involved. So um, definitely it's, it's, it's the time is now to get involved and um, we, can, we can make this difference. I want to talk a bit more about your campaign in a minute. Now you uh, yourself, you left Iran with your family when you were age two. Yes, uh, well m closer to one but yes. Uh, and have you ever been back? No, it'd be too dangerous for me to go back. Just being so outspoken on women's rights and, um, you know, rights of the children and, and the Iranian people, um, my websites have been banned in Iran, and um, it just wouldn't be the wise thing to do to go back right now. I mean, there's other um, expats who have gone back, and they've been charged on charges of s s becoming spies or, or the such, and these are f false um, accusations. So it would be... Um, not right for me to go back right away. And shortly before you left, your father was jailed. He was tortured mm -hmm. by the Revolutionary Guards in Iran. That was shortly after the, the Shah was toppled. Uh, why yes. was he jailed? Um, he was the general manager of the Sheraton Hotel at the time. And um, under the new Islamic rule, it was forbidding um, the serving of alcohol or for music to be played. And on, in this Western hotel, my father was allowing these things. So they um, imprisoned him, tortured him, wanted to execute him. Out of some luck, we were able to get him out of prison, and he escaped right away to Spain, where we met up with him and then eventually made our life here in Canada. You know, the Iranian government over the years since the revolution has been accused of many human rights violations. Why did you focus uh, particularly on the death penalty? Well, this um, Stop Child Executions campaign is as a result of the success that we had last year on the Save Nazanin Fatihi campaign. I think you mentioned in your introduction about a young girl who was on death row, three men attempted to rape her, and out of self-defense, she stabbed one of these men, and he, she, was, she was then convicted of murder and sentenced to death. So I was outraged by this one particular story, and I campaigned internationally and got international support, 350,000 signatures on a petition, and lobbying different um, international bodies like the UN and the EU and the Canadian Parliament, where eventually, with great lawyers that we found for her and also the help of the, the world, we were able to grant a stay of execution for her and order a new trial, basically put enough pressure on the government to do something. And um, now she's free, um, she's living a quote-unquote normal life, and um, so we know that with international pressure something can be done. So what we've done now is we've upped the campaign and we're trying to put a permanent end to the situation. So my concentration is mostly on this 
campaign of stop child executions because I know that um, we, if we do unite together, we can make the difference. Um, I know that if we make this one step forward and we're able to change the laws, then that will lead way to larger campaigns um, fighting for human rights in general for the Iranian people. You know, uh, Nazanin, your namesake there, as you point out, she was exonerated at the retrial, but she was ordered to pay something called blood money. What is that? Blood money, it's, um, it's an amount you pay. It's sort of a compensation amount to the family of, of the victim. Um, in her last trial, Nazanin was, um, two of the judges wanted to her to be released unconditionally, but three of the judges said that she used excessive force while trying to defend herself. In other words, she shouldn't have used a knife when there's three larger men attacking her, which is ridiculous. But anyways, so they wanted her to pay about $35,000 in blood money to the family of the victim. Um, we were not prepared as a campaign to raise blood money, raise an amount for someone's life, especially since she was innocent. She, she was trying to defend herself. So instead, what we did, we raised um, bail money until the time it takes to... Um, have this um, trial um, for the blood money appealed. Now this appeal is still going through, but all in all, even if um, they do not accept, um, if they, they still make her pay the blood money, that'll come out of the bail amount and she'll still be freed. But um, it's a dangerous um, thing to play with because there's been other minors on death row who now they're quote unquote saved because they had enough funds to pay or they were able to get people to put in money to this b b blood money amount, which is, again, as I said, dangerous because it creates a precedence, and um, where does it end? And this is a common practice, this uh, sort of demand for, for cash uh, and the payment. Uh. It's very common under Sharia law. Again, like if, if you get into an accident um, and you kill somebody, uh, you, normally the blood money amount is also there. and and under the law, a woman's life is worth half that of man, so that you'll have to only pay half the amount if you kill a woman than if you kill a man. Okay, let's get another question in from one of our viewers. We have Gilbert calling from Iran. Gilbert, what's your question? Um, I have a comment. Uh, I just wanted to make a, make a very brief one. Uh, I believe that uh, it's a little bit uh, different to compare uh, basic, basically the Western uh, way of uh, laws uh, to other countries. I mean, you cannot have a uniform way of ruling the world. And I think it is a little bit uh, overrated to, to, with, the, with the propaganda machine, which is working against uh, the Iranian uh, way of life. I'm an uh, expat myself, returning from the U.S. and living in Iran. And, um, and I mean, the, the Sharia work, the law works for this country very well. And I really believe that, uh, you know, if we bring the Western culture to Iran, we will have a very, very, very big confusion. That's it. This well. is not a matter of cultural relativism. You cannot say violating international human rights law. In other words, killing children for teaching Baha'i classes or homosexuality is right. No country can claim that they can execute a minor. This is not a matter of cultures. Iran is not working well under Sharia law, or at least their interpretation of Sharia law, which is very extreme very discriminatory and um, I'm actually very offended by the by this concept I mean this is a, this is not a matter of bringing Western values to Iran Iran is living under a very free and democratic system up until I mean now the, the introduction of these inter, um, d uh, extreme forms of, d of Sharia law this creates um, a very bad situation for women and children well, I've got an email here. It takes a very different view. The uh, writer of this email takes a very different view from the one you've just been telling us about. Uh, it's from Kenneth in Malaysia. And uh, Kenneth says, as the world becomes more perverted, children 12 and older should be held accountable for their actions. If they're old enough to do the crime, they should reap what they sow. Malaysia has stiff penalties on crime. As a result, they have a safer society. Now, if a child um, commits a crime, definitely there should be some um, form of um, uh, reputation, I mean, uh, if, they, if they need to go to jail or if they need to get um, some kind of help, yes, I agree, but um, there has been scientists throughout the world who have um, done studies on the human brain and at that young age, you're not able to fully make um, 
those kinds of decisions. You, your brain is not functioning at the same level, and the UN has documented these things, and there are reasons why we call children children and um, adults adults. So there should be a distinction, and this is, again, international human rights law. The world has agreed on this. This is not some concept that I'm coming out with. Nazani, where does your campaign go to from here? You've been telling us about the campaign on the internet. What else is being done? Mm -hmm. Well, we do different sorts of campaigns. Like we um, we create documentaries, and that gets spread and gets um, the word out on the executions of minors, um, rallying on the streets, and just getting the international community involved. Writing individual letters to their local members of parliament, writing to the uh, leaders in Iran. Um, and even um, pressuring the UN to enforce these laws, because what's the point of a, just a piece of paper if there's not, they're not going to enforce it? So there's a lot of different ways. And again, on StopChildExecutions.com, we list different ways of how people can get involved. Now, Zanin, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks mm -hmm. for joining us. We've run out of time. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us. Uh, looking ahead to tomorrow's show, we talk with author and Pulitzer Prize winner Lawrence Wright about his book and stage play Looming Tower, which delves into the lives of Al-Qaeda members and their families. Don't forget, if you have any thoughts about pressing issues around the world, send us your emails and send them to riz at aljazeera.net. See you next time. Street Talk is next. <laughs>